Welcome to our first um, and perhaps our least populated Whitehead <laughs> Connects event of the 2017-2018 academic year. I'm sorry to say, Maria and Kate, we usually have a better crowd. But, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, my name is David Page, and I'm the director of Whitehead Institute. Tonight, we have the privilege of welcoming back to Whitehead Institute Kate Rubens, a former Whitehead Fellow and current NASA astronaut, as our featured guest. And it is also our distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Maria Zuber back to Whitehead Institute. I'm going to introduce, yes, let's, let's welcome you both. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> and I, I should say we were just chatting and, and Maria remarked uh, on seeing Kate in her garb that Maria could have come in costume as well and we would have had um, in any case. But uh, yeah, I don't know what we would have had. But uh, so let me introduce Maria. Maria Zuber is the E.A. Griswold Professor of Geophysics and Vice President for Research at MIT. She is responsible at MIT for uh, research administration and policy. And in that role, she also oversees the MIT Lincoln Laboratory and more than a dozen interdisciplinary research laboratories and centers, including the Koch Institute across the street. Uh, <clears throat> Vice President Zuber is the first woman to lead a science department at MIT, and she is the first to lead a NASA planetary mission. So since 1990, she has held leadership roles associated with scientific experiments or instrumentation on nine NASA missions, most notably serving as principal investigator of the GRAIL mission, which stands for Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory. Let me tell you a little bit about it. So the GRAIL mission flew twin spacecraft named Ebb and Flo, uh, <coughs> Ebb and Flow, uh, she, uh, they, they flew twin spacecraft in tandem around the moon to precisely measure and map variations in the moon's gravitational field. And these twin rockets generated the highest resolution gravity field map of any celestial body, revealing an abundance of features never before seen in detail. The data also showed that the moon's gravity field is unlike that of any uh, other terrestrial planet, or any, is unlike that of any terrestrial planet in our solar system, and it will provide a better understanding of how Earth and other rocky planets in the solar system formed and evolved. Maria has been named one of the 50 most important women in science, and she serves as chair of the National Science Board. And I cannot overstate the importance of her service to our community and to the country as chair of the National Science Board. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maria Zuber to the podium. Okay, David, thank you very much. So it is, uh, it is so great to be here, okay? Uh, space exploration and biomedical research. What a combination. Uh, is this fantastic or what? So they're both cutting edge. They're both high risk. And, you know, as I was putting these remarks together, you know, all I could think of was peanut butter and chocolate. Okay, okay. Two things that are pretty good that when combined create something far greater than the sum of their parts, okay? So, um, so we are, uh, we are gonna have uh, fun tonight. So, um, so in my opening remarks, um, David had asked me to, um, to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, research support and the status of the federal budget. And um, 
And so, um, so it reminded me that uh, the first time that I um, went down to work um, in Washington, um, Chuck Vest was the president of MIT. And uh, Chuck s called me into his office. I was, I was going to be on a presidential commission, and they always picked one young person to be on a presidential commission because they needed someone to do all the work, OK? <laughs> and, um, and so he called me in. And, uh, and he said, Maria, you're going to do great, OK? He said, what, think about it this way. Washington is another planet. You just don't need a spacecraft to get there, OK? <laughs> so he said, and you map alien landscape, and landscapes for a living, so, um, so this is going to be just old hat to you, OK? So, um, and, uh, and then he said, um, watch out for the Klingons. So, <laughs> so. Um, and um, uh, well, I mean, that just demonstrates uh, how we know uh, in so many other ways what a wise, wise uh, person uh, Chuck was. So, um, so, uh, so let me talk. I'm, and I'm going to focus here on, um, on the life sciences um, budget. So, so in this country, we are, um, we are very, very fortunate. Um, research and development has long had um, great support um, from, uh, from Congress. So um, in the discretionary part of the budget, so these are the uh, halcyon days that were still, um, you know, Cold War um, uh, related. But, um, but this is uh, R&D is a, a percent of the discretionary output. And then the non-defense R and D, um, and and so you know after the end of the Cold War, you know things uh, you know things have kind of flattened out, but but it was always about ten percent of the um, discretionary budget, so really um, really pretty good. Okay, now the the problem um, that we have here is that there's great great pressure on the discretionary um, budget. Um, all the activities in the United States, and this includes um, all research. So if you, um, if, you, uh, if you look at this here, um, so here's research, education, infrastructure, and, um, and these are um, payments to individuals. So this is Social Security and, uh, and Medicare, okay? So it, um, you know, this just keeps going up, up, up in a rather um, unbounded way. And, um, and we've been fortunate. You know, we have held our own um, because there is an understanding of the importance of um, research uh, in this country. Okay, so, um, so let's look at the uh, funding um, for basic research. So here's, you know, dollars on this axis. And, um, and so here's just, you know, some of the federal agencies. So National Institutes of Health, the NSF, Department of Energy, NASA, and the Department of Defense. And, um, and this ranges from uh, the late 1980s um, up until uh, this year. And, um, and it's, you know, it's gone kind of monotonically um, up. And, and actually, in terms of planning, OK, uh, planning a research agenda, um, uh, a monotonic um, increase is, uh, is a good thing. Okay, it's it's not as great as an exponential growth, but it's the it's the variability and the inability to plan um, that that causes uh, great distress and a great amount of uh, stress. And how do you bring students into the system? And you know, is is somebody you know is there going to be enough uh, funding to complete a PhD or a, or a research project? Um, in the early two thousands. Um, the, uh, the halcyon days, we had a near doubling of the NIH budget, uh, which, um, which resulted in many, many discoveries, some of which uh, were made by this, uh, this very institution um, right here. And, um, and then the bubble burst. And, um, and what you can see here is a, uh, a net decline here in uh, research funding uh, for the NIH, which, uh, which of course is very problematic. So a um, couple of uh, eye charts here. Um, so I, I just pulled out uh, MIT and some of the, the top institutions where, where I will say, uh, 
you know, using some of the astronaut, researchers are running full throttle, okay, at these institutions, okay? And, um, and so, um, so if you look at all R&D expenditures, um, even with the challenging times um, that we have uh, dealt with, uh, research budgets have generally um, been increasing, not increasing rapidly, but, uh, but, uh, but increasing. But if you look at the federal contributions to those research budgets, you see a lot of straight lines, okay? The federal funding um, has been, um, been essentially uh, flat, okay? And, um, and so if the budgets are going up, it means the funding, the investment uh, in that research um, is coming from someplace else. Okay. Okay, so here's, um, here's the uh, HHS uh, NIH budget um, over the same period. Um, if you pull these out, you know, obviously um, institutions that have medical schools tend to get a larger um, uh, fraction of those funds, um, but everybody um, is pretty much uh, flat in terms of uh, the federal uh, investment. Uh, but here are, um, here are nonprofits. Okay, nonprofits, uh, largely foundations, and um, and you can see that the funding um, for the top institutions um, has mainly been going up. Um, at uh, at MIT um, in the period from 2000 to um, uh, last year, 2016, the number of foundation proposals that were submitted um, in in a year has gone up by 150 percent. Okay, so foundations, which are supported by, uh, largely by personal philanthropy, have done, have been crucial, crucial um, in, um, in filling that gap. Okay, so, um, so looking at the contributions um, to um, research expenditures um, in higher education, um, the federal funding um, went up uh, nicely here, um, and then it, uh, you know, went back down, goes back up, um, and is headed uh, and is headed down. So, so at MIT, um, the contribution of federal funding to um, to our research decreases about a percentage point a year. So right right now, this past year. Um, 66% of MIT's funding um, is federal, and the rest of the sources um, are non-federal. And, um, and so you can look at non-federal um, industry, uh, other nonprofits, uh, but the, um, the, the line here that keeps going up is uh, you know, really the higher education, and, um, and this is really, um, personal philanthropy. These are universities investing their own funds, investing their endowment funds to support research. And so this is the generosity of individuals who, um, who provide funds to, uh, to universities and research institutes. So, um, so I, wa I wanted to go over this. This is the, um, this is the status of the um, negotiations that are underway in the House and Senate in comparison to the, uh, um, the White House FY18 um, budget request. So, um, so this is what was passed in FY17. Um, this is what the White House recommended and the change um, from FY17 to, uh, to FY18. Um, the president proposed a 22% cut to NIH. Um, uh, let's see, a 21% cut to diabetes. Uh, if you're getting old, the, a 36% cut to aging research. Um, and, um, uh, well, you can see that an average of 22% cut um, to the NIH. Um, uh, even in these challenging budgetary times, um, both the House and the Senate, and, um, and both 
the Democrats and the moderate Republicans. So the far-right conservatives, Tea Party, uh, want um, cost-cutting without consideration of what the consequences are. Um, but we have actually great bipartisan support for um, research. So, um, so you can get a sense here. Uh, so obviously red is a decrease with respect to FY17. Um, green is uh, as an increase with respect to FY17. And, um, and the House and the Senate um, uh, have, uh, have, provi have uh, provided increases um, in nearly all categories. And these still need to be resolved, and they won't be resolved until um, December. Um, I think, but, um, but the, the point is clear. So what, what this actually translates to is um, uh, with the president calling for a 22% cut in NIH, and the president made it clear um, that he wasn't against um, biomedical research, that, um, uh, that he, uh, he needs to build a wall, and the NIH is one of the largest discretionary budget items and um, so the, uh, the NIH budget was being cut um, in order to um, support other um, administration priorities. Um, but Congress, um, what this translates to is Congress um, has agreed to essentially a $2 billion increase in the NIH budget um, for next year, um, which, is, uh, which is likely to, um, to happen. So, so there is, um, you know, the Senate, uh, you know, exceeds the current caps. This is going to be have to get dealt again, dealt with again in, in um, December because of the uh, uh, exceeding the um, the, the budget cap. Uh, the House Appropriations exceeds the defense cap, but the non-discretionary is below the cap, and um, and it's not clear how these differences will be resolved. But NIH um, looks like it's going to do very um, well in this, and so. Um, so the, the summary here then is um, that the, the federal government actually has been extremely generous in their support of U.S. research, particularly biomedical research, but the growth of entitlements puts greater and greater pressure on discretionary spending. Um, the NIH is a big uh, line item uh, in the discretionary budget, and despite its strong support, it, it is being targeted, but... Uh, dark forces are being um, effectively managed by the commitment of our elected representatives. Um, philanthropy, uh, you can see the role of philanthropy in the charts that I've showed you. Um, the philanthropic uh, gifts uh, by donors, uh, it's not just a small add-on. It is absolutely critical and essential to moving the conduct of the research uh, forward. Um, and, um, and what I think is the, the really um, good news that, that we try hard to articulate and we need to try even harder to, to articulate f to, uh, to people in this country who have been left behind um, in the economic growth of the country is, um, you know, science has a very essential role to play in the country's economic competitiveness and prosperity, in our national security, um, in human health, and in education of the next generation. Um, it, is a, it is a great story to tell. And, um, and um, we are all blessed to be able to um, participate in this enterprise. And, um, and we need to convey uh, our gratitude um, and we need to convey the importance of what we do um, to the citizenry of this country. And so, um, so those are my remarks, and I'll stop there, and I'm going to introduce uh, Kate. Okay? So now we're going to have the real fun. Okay? So, so. And NASA funding looks fine <laughs> next year. <laughs> the, the, the NASA funding, it's, um, if you look at the institutions, it's, it's actually kind of variable because... Uh, um, at, uh, at academic institutions, big space missions really skew the, um, the, the numbers from year to year. So it looks, 
it looks a little bit, uh, you know, zigzaggy and um, and confusing if you don't go into it. So you could look at it and say, what mission just came on? What mission is going away? And um, so, but but NASA's NASA's going to be okay. So, um, okay. So Kate Rubens is here with us tonight, and uh, we are so delighted that she is. Uh, she was uh, she was born in uh, Connecticut and grew up in Napa, California. Um, went to UCSD and then on to uh, to Stanford for a PhD, and she joined uh, Whitehead as a fellow, uh, which is where um, I met her. And um, you know, uh, study infectious diseases. I'm thinking, how does how does somebody like this make astronaut? Well, she did field work in the Congo, okay, in, uh, in you know, under very, you know, uh, trying conditions, okay, and, um, and, and had the courage to study, you know, terrible diseases like, uh, like Ebola, okay, which so much uh, need uh, effort. And, uh, and then uh, NASA, NASA is really good at finding people who have the ability to fly in space. Um, they are very good at finding these people, and they found Kate. And uh, she participated in Expedition 48 and 49 in, um, from July through October in, uh, in 2016, where she became the first person to sequence DNA in space. I mean, that, is, that, is that cool or what? <laughs> so, so you could retire right now, and you've got your... <laughs> And that will be great. So um, please join me in welcoming Kate, who's going to tell us about her time in space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, uh, David, for hosting me here. And thanks, Maria, for the great introduction. Um, it's, it is just incredibly fantastic. I can't tell you guys what it feels like to come back into Whitehead. Um, you know, we spent a number of years here. This is, this is a wonderful place. This is where I really got to start my research career as an independent investigator. And then uh, David very patiently helped me pick up the pieces as I ended my research career here and, and uh, started a new uh, career of flying and doing research in space. And so I brought a, a video, a short video back of the mission, and, and I think we'll have some time for uh, some questions afterwards. But I wanted to share with you a little bit about what it's like uh, to fly in space, the kinds of things that we're doing on space station and some of the experiments that we were doing here. Um, so this is the, the video of Expedition uh, 48 and 49. And so there's a lot that leads up to this. There's about two and a half years of training before this. There's a lot of uh, learning how to fly jets and, and learning Russian and learning the space station systems. But I'm really going to start on the day of launch. So we launched from Baikonur, Kazakhstan. Uh, we're out in the middle of, of the Kazakh desert, essentially. We wake up incredibly early, and we start pressure testing our spacesuits. Um, we actually walk out, and, and this is a peculiar Russian custom. We report to the commission, and we get certified for space flight right before we walk onto the rocket. Um, so we, we go up the stairs early in the morning. We sit on top of our capsule for about four hours. Uh, it sort of just looks like the sim, and everything seems normal inside the simulator until uh, the whole thing starts to move and shake and vibrate, and we actually uh, blast off the planet. Uh, we orbited for about two days in our spacecraft until we docked to the International Space Station. It's incredible as you're coming up and you see this bright, uh, glowing object. We've trained all over the world. We've trained in Japan and Moscow and, and in Europe, but we've never seen the inside of the real space station. We've only seen mock-ups before. So we open up this hatch. After we've docked our spacecraft, we go through the hatch. Uh, we, we see our crewmates that we're going to be living with in space for the next few months. And it's this absolutely incredible feeling to be docked to the real space station. Uh, of course, the first thing NASA has you do is a press conference. Um, and, and you're a little queasy at this point, so you're just hoping that goes well. Um, but we, within about 72 hours, we actually got right into it. This is my crewmate, Takuya Onishi, and I. Uh, we had a visiting vehicle. We had a SpaceX Dragon coming at the space station. So you can imagine you're both going along at 17,500 miles an hour. Uh, we have to make sure that the space station is, is in free drift, is uncontrolled, and we reach out with the robotic arm and we grapple the spacecraft. This is a don't mess it up moment, uh, absolutely. We were pretty excited that that all went well and, and this, we got the spacecraft berthed because that meant that the international docking adapter was on board. And this is a piece of hardware that we've been waiting for a long time. Uh, most importantly for the astronauts, this meant that we got to do a spacewalk to install it. 
uh, which you're not, you're not always guaranteed that. Um, and I actually was, uh, I've, I'm only the 12th woman ever to do a spacewalk. So this was something that I certainly did not take for granted. It's a lot of preparation. You're in the suits for about 11 hours total. You do pre-breathe to get rid of the nitrogen in your body. Um, you work, you get all your tools installed on your workstation. Uh, our IV put us in the airlock. We depress the airlock and then you open the hatch to the outside. There's nothing like that feeling of coming outside the hatch and unlike training in the neutral buoyancy laboratory in the pool, uh, there is no floor below you. There's just the planet 250 miles away. Um, there's not a lot of time to focus on things like that. You're working pretty hard. Uh, every minute counts during a spacewalk. Um, you're very aware that you're in the elements, in your spacesuit. It's, you know, between 200 and negative 200 degrees outside. You can feel these hot and cold fluctuations. Um, everything that you're trying to do is delicate and costs more money than you could ever repay the government in your lifetime. <laughs> and you can't do a connector wrong. It, you are working on the spacecraft outside. I did get a chance to take a few moments uh, and have some distinct memories of passing over um, North Africa and Morocco and looking at the water um, and looking at a few places. We got back in and NASA said, good job guys, you're going out again in 10 days. You're going to go do another spacewalk. So um, this one was to actually retract this giant radiator, which is a micrometeoroid debris risk uh, on board the space station, as well as uh, fly with the robotic arm and install some high definition cameras. And so it's, it's really fun to put hardware uh, on the space station, and you can feel like, you know, this, this is sort of your hardware. I'm constantly checking if these cameras are doing okay, because I feel like uh, these, are, these are our cameras that we've installed. They're used to take high definition images, both for ground controllers as well as for science uh, and education groups. So we came back in, um, and, and we had this kind of big time of spacewalks and robotics. We were so busy uh, the first few weeks that it wasn't really until a few weeks into the mission that we got a chance to spend a significant portion of our time in the cupola. And this is, this is the, the amazing place on the space station where you have seven windows. So you can actually look out at the entire Earth. And you can, if you, it took me a few weeks to figure this out, but if you curl yourself up in a ball, you can actually fit your entire body in the cupola and fly over the planet. Um, this, this takes a few orbits sometimes where you just can't leave this space because you're curled up in a ball and you're flying over the entire continent of Africa at night looking at thunderstorms or down the coast of California. Um, there's a lot of ocean time, but there's a lot of places in the world I know I will never visit, but I got a chance to fly over and with a camera or with my eye actually see what these places are looking like. If you th see things like glaciers, um, we can look a lot at uh, you know, geologic formations. So this isn't just you know, astronauts having fun in the cupola, Some, sometimes it is, but there's a lot of scientific targets actually that we can take with astronaut photography. So we can document weather phenomena, we can document changes uh, in, in oceans or land mass, and we can do a lot that's actually looking at uh, things like after Hurricane Matthew came through, we did a lot of disaster relief photos and looking at the flooding uh, and the wake. And it's one of these things that you think after a little while this view might get old or you would get used to it. Until the day I left, I could not stop looking at the planet. It is one of the most amazing sights. Of course, you can't spend all your time looking outside. A lot of what we were doing was uh, investigations inside. So this is a U.S. lab, and you can see um, if this, was, if this was my lab at home, I'd be horrified and tell my postdocs to clean up because it's, it's everywhere with NASA. But um, this is actually an investigation in the glove box. We were looking at cardiomyocytes and how they function in space uh, and doing one of the first examples of some really long duration cell culture in space. Another thing that, um, uh, that Maria mentioned was actually the first DNA sequencing in space. And so this you can see is the, the microfluidics platform that we use to sequence DNA. Uh, I wasn't quite sure at first with this experiment you know, what's really the motivation behind that? And we started thinking a lot more about how we're gonna actually use uh, the ISS as a research laboratory. You do really start to need to get answers to some of these things in situ. So you want to, to start understand, for example, the microbiome of the space station. Uh, we wanna be able to look at that genomically and we wanna look at that in real time. All of these physiological parameters that happen when you have somebody in space, you wanna actually be able to look at time courses that not just pre and post flight samples. Some of the other things that we were doing, um, we're really trying to consider the concepts that you would use to make this more of a molecular biology laboratory. Um, so my crewmates knew any experiment that was anything to deal with uh, molecules was mine. I wouldn't let them do it. And there were some pretty interesting and inventive <laughs> ways of doing science. Uh, if you don't necessarily have all the centrifuges or the, the equipment that you would have on Earth, we were able to 3D print a rotor uh, and put that on the drill. It's a perfectly adequate centrifuge. Um, 
one of the things that I actually brought up, I, you have a, a small psych support allocation. Your, your spouse can pack you cookies or chips. I said, this is ridiculous. This is up mass to space. I want pipettes and plates <laughs> and tips and tubes. And my husband complied and, and sent me all these wonderful things. And so um, I actually was really interested in, can we use the tools that we would see in standard molecular biology, can we use these on board? For, for so many years, the dogma was you can't pipette in space. It's a, that just won't work. The fluids are going to go all over. Um, there's a little bit different about the way I set up my lab bench. You can see the pipettes are upside down and sticking to a piece of duct tape because um, it actually keeps them nice and secure on the surface. But our main finding was that you can use a lot of the methods that you would use in standard terrestrial biology. The fluids will generally be held in place by surface tension. You have to deal with things like objects floating, um, but a lot of the assays that we can set up on the ground, I think, should not be a problem to set up on board. And this has changed our thinking at NASA a little bit about how we approach some of the molecular biology experiments. Some of the other experiments um, that, that I worked on with my crewmate talk involved uh, exposure of, of things to the actual space atmosphere. So there's some really interesting things that you can look at when you put experiments into vacuum. We use the Japanese airlock here, put it on an external platform. And you can look at things uh, like the exposure to space vacuum, what happens to materials in space over long times, how we might build better spacecraft. You can actually also launch things from space station. And this is incredible to see because you launch this, the uh, microsatellites, the nanosatellites, and they actually fall away from you uh, into a lower orbit. It, it's a little bit of a vertigo feeling to see these satellites falling away. Uh, one of the things that we spent uh, a fair amount of time on was the combustion chamber on board. And so uh, we can actually look at uh, the way things combust in space. We can look at droplet combustion, uh, as well as how flames burn. And, and, and they don't burn as expected. They have a different shape uh, on board. And this is just, you know, there's 275 material science investigations. This is just an example of some of them. This is actually uh, an experiment using an MIT payload that's sometimes used for education. Um, but is, is the Sphere uh, satellites. And we uh, have hooked this up here with two cameras and a large tank. And so it's about a 20 liter tank with four liters of fluid in it. Uh, one of the things that we can do here is, is either manually or uh, propelled by these small spacecraft within a spacecraft, look at what, what's happening to the fluid in this tank. And this is really uh, interesting and important to understand in terms of our understanding of how fluids are behaving in a larger scale of microgravity. I'd, talk the PIs into letting me do some additional experiments uh, outside the apparatus to just look at manual maneuvers and, and uh, observe what's happening with the fluids in the tank if, as you give various inputs and various maneuvers. Um, and, and this was pretty fascinating. I think we collected 20 or 30 extra data points because I couldn't stop playing with this thing. Uh, about halfway through the, the expedition, we got three new crewmates. We rotate our Soyuz vehicles. Uh, and shortly thereafter, we got um, a much larger cargo vehicle. So this is the orbital ATK vehicle. Uh, it had several tons of, of food, supplies, uh, the logistics to keep all of these experiments running, the, the consumables needed to restock uh, these 275 different experiments that we have going on. Um, we were pretty excited to get in there because there's usually some fresh food hidden in there somewhere. Um, and then the big task starts, which is unpacking all of this cargo uh, that, that relies on the human tethered crew portion of the mission. So we were there for a total of 115 days. Um, it, it seems like it went by uh, just like that. And I would go back to space tomorrow if I could. I, I really think this is one of the most incredible places to live and work. Um, the day came, we had to undock. Uh, I, I tried to stay. They said, no, you have to go back to the planet. Um, <laughs> we, got in our, we got in our Soyuz spacecraft. And this is a, it's a, it's a much smaller spacecraft. It's incredible after living on the station to be back in this a very small vehicle orbiting the Earth. Uh, we, did, we just do a few orbits of the planet, and we actually burn our, do our deorbit burn and start coming through the atmosphere. And you can imagine what the energy is like that you need to burn off 17,500 miles an hour down to zero, uh, and you're going through the Earth's atmosphere. This, this comes off in terms of an ablative heat shield. And so we're, we're basically in this giant plasma ball. We're in a meteor um, headed for Earth. It's, uh, I would say it's a little bit more dynamic even than launches. Um, the, uh, the parachute opening sequence is, is a little crazy. And by the time the NASA photographer captures it, it looks like everything's very calm and, and, and lovely. It hasn't adequately captured what we've gone through to that point, which is not the biggest thing. The biggest thing is uh, the moment that you have your, your impact. And this, this is not a car accident. This is several car accidents followed by a train derailment. Um, and uh, we weren't sure if we were upside down or right side up. We actually had to ask the SAR forces when they pulled us out which side the capsule was on. 
Um, we, we get out and uh, this is really the first time that, that we're back on the planet. We're feeling any wind. Uh, we're breathing uh, a real atmosphere, not a regenerated atmosphere. Uh, but it's an incredible feeling to be back with your crewmates and all of a sudden be surrounded by people and be back on the planet again. Uh, leads to this big perspective shift. We were mostly just incredibly happy that we had a successful mission. Uh, we made our contribution and we were back with the people that we loved. So that's, that is my uh, mission video and a little summary of Expedition 4849. Bravo. So we're going we're gonna to have some questions for Kate. And I'd like to start with one of them. You trained, actually for at least seven years to do all of this. And I imagine that covered a very broad range of everything from learning to fly jets to meteorology to many other kinds of sciences. What did your training not prepare you for? <laughs> uh, it, it didn't prepare me quite for what it's like to see the planet. And you get, you get briefs, we talk about this in the astronaut office over lunch, you know, and everybody says, oh, it's so amazing, this is just, just going to, you know, it's all these kind of crusty old fighter pilots that get emotional about this. And, and I was a little bit cynical. I'm like, it, I'm excited to fly in space. It can't be that good. You know, whatever, whatever. I've seen the videos. I've watched Mission Control, you know, hundreds of hours on shifts. I was not prepared for what took my breath away when I saw the planet. It is... It is this glowing blue orb sort of suspended in space, and it is like nothing I've ever seen before. And I, I, all the training, uh, all the preparation in the world just could not prepare me for what it was like to actually see the planet. Questions? Phil. So after landing, they take you off, and you're not standing. <laughs> you're you're uh, you fly. How long did it take you to recover? Yeah, so you're, you're not standing because you're not very good at standing. <laughs> and they don't want that on camera. So you actually, um, <laughs> you, you actually get, get taken out. You're in a reclined position. The most immediate effect is this neurovestibular effect. So uh, you get that going up into space, but it's actually much worse. I got this briefing when I was on board sitting around the dinner table with my commander, and he's like, and it is going to suck going back to gravity. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> you know, could you have told me about this before I was in space? It really is terrible to come back to gravity. It is awful. Um, one of the experiments I participated in is this great experiment where they, you know, they test uh, nerve vestibular and like 10 different tests about your locomotion and your balance. And um, you're, you're really awful at it. For the first about two weeks, uh, you're, you've, you've lost a lot of proprioception. Um, you're used to just effortlessly tapping your toe and floating across a module. So to get all of that back, to get your brain reoriented in like how to walk and how to operate in a gravity field is very difficult and everything feels heavy for a long time. Just my arms would feel heavy, I'd feel heavy laying on a bed. Uh, I'd pick up my iPad and say, you know, God, Apple's made these things like 15 pounds heavier <laughs> since I left. It would fall down. Uh, I would pick up some food off the the dinner table and I'd hold my fork upside down and then wonder why it was dropping off the <laughs> fork. And so this experience of gravity was, it, once you get used to not having it, uh, it was actually really interesting to experience it. After about 45 days is our rehab period and we do a lot, we do two and a half hours a day of intensive kind of rehab physical training. It's a lot of the training you would do uh, for somebody who's had a stroke. Um, just how to, you know, how to get yourself back to, to walking and then running and then lifting and back in good form. But it is quite a few months uh, to really get um, adapted. It's not that we lose things in space or we're maladapted to space. We actually adapt really well to space. And we start shedding all this stuff that we don't need anymore, like, like proprioception, uh, you know, bones, not so necessary. <laughs> we start to lose those. The, the body is incredible at adapting. It's also, it's painful, but it is pretty incredible to readapt as well. Go ahead. Have, have, uh, there have been studies, uh, functional imaging studies of the brain as the astronauts re regain their earthly functions to understand what kind of rewiring is serving that? Yeah, one of those actually just came out pretty recently. Um, and I participated in, in one of the, the studies. And, and I'd, I'd love to have an MRI on board. We don't. Um, but we do a lot of pre and then post-flight. 
uh, MRIs. And, and one of the interesting things that came out of that is they actually saw a lot of, um, there's a lot of loss in, in various areas. You know, you're just, you're not using it, you're not activating it anymore. There is some gain in terms of your lower limb uh, sensing and motion and, and the authors were trying to figure out, you know, hey, what's going on here? And I said, oh, I, you know, this I have figured out because you actually use, your feet turn into a sensory organ. You need to use those to stabilize yourself and position yourself all the time. So you're, st you're using your toes to like figure out without looking where to put your feet so that you can stabilize. And all of a sudden you're using your feet to actually keep you positioned. And it turns into an instinctual thing. It's like walking and you don't think about it. But you're always having to put a force in with your foot, um, you know, or a little tap somewhere with your lower body to get you in a place or to stabilize you. That's a completely different way than we use our lower limbs on, on the ground. And there's, there's a lot of other pretty interesting stuff that's falling out of that. But um, it's kind of amazing how you can develop pathways for things that you are not designed to function to do in microgravity. Yes. I'm curious, other than pipetting, what other research sort of myths did you bust while you were in space? And then my second question is, uh, what was Russian space food like? So um, in, in terms of research myths, uh, I don't know that it was a myth, but, there, but we haven't really done a lot of long-term cell culture. We've done some short-term cell culture studies. Um, it, was, it was a little unclear if astronauts could do long-term cell culture without contaminating them. Um, I was like, you know, we can teach people. We can teach people how to fly a supersonic fighter jet. We can teach the pilots how to do cell culture. This with a good <laughs> sterile technique. Um, so we we did that. We we proved that you could do that for a long time. They're a lot very worried about bubbles in the system. Uh, any system uh, that you get that you know you, you no longer have the the liquid going to the bottom of your vessel, whatever it is, and the and the air going to the top. You don't have that air liquid separation, and so bubbles can be a problem uh, in any biological system. And so thinking about how to design that. Uh, some of the other things that we did was start using a lot more high throughput methods on board, and that's something that I'm, I feel pretty strongly about, that we need to maximize our use of the space station. We need to start doing things in, in hundreds or thousands of replicates for these experiments. Uh, and for Russian space food, um, it, on the ground, you do your taste testing, and it all comes in cans, and it, it sort of looks like cat food, and I wasn't really excited, and I didn't order too much. And you get on board, and there's something about your taste change. And let me tell you, the Russians know how to make Space food. It is, it's salty and it's fatty and it's, it's got flavor to it and it is way better. The US space food has been engineered. We engineered all the salt out of it because we were really worried about um, kidney stones and, and salt and everything like that. The Russians go ahead, they throw it in and it is so good. We were, we were bartering all the time for dinner from those guys. So. <laughs> yes, back there. Yeah, what other kinds of equipment? Um, so there's, we have pretty good equipment in terms of uh, cell culture. We're starting to work on that. I, I'd like some more automated cell culture systems that don't need to be astronaut tended. We actually have an excellent uh, rodent habitat that, that I worked on a, a while ago at NASA that's been through a number of experiments. Uh, and the Japanese Space Agency now has a, a functional ro rodent habitat that includes a centrifuge. So they can do a 1G control on board. Um, we have some microscopy, not as much. Uh, as I'd like, and, and that's something that's a, a pretty big area that they're working on developing now. Um, th there's really a, an opportunity to do a lot of uh, microfluidics and, and small high throughput technologies on board that we're not uh, quite used. It, it takes so long to develop a piece of equipment for spaceflight that we're, if you think about it, it's about 10 years behind what you would find in, in most labs. And so sort of fast forwarding to these really small uh, devices, I think, is an, an incredibly efficient way to use the, the limited time and up mass resources we have for on board. Yes. Um, so, uh, um, if you were Yeah, I have to go home and have some negotiations with my husband. But um, I really <laughs> Do you want I, to repeat that? Exactly. She said, "Would you, if you could live in space the rest of your life, would you?" Um, I loved it up there. I really did. And and some astronauts like it, and some just want to come home. They they want to be on a shuttle mission. and They want to come home right away. Um, I four months wasn't enough. I w I would probably spend the rest of my life off my, off the planet if I could. It's such an amazing experience. Yes. That's a good question. Your cosmic ray experience in the environment, uh, did you experience it? What can you tell us about it? Yeah, yeah, I actually uh, had to send an email to a couple of my, my uh, 
radiation physics friends saying, I got the zaps in my eyeballs, you know, and it, it's like you're very excited. So there's this phenomenon when you close your eyes at night, um, you'll get little pings, little white flashes. It looks like a, like a single white dot. Um, and it's because you're, you're getting a receptor energized by, by a, um, a particle coming through, which when you think about it, you're like, that's not great. It's going, <laughs> <laughs> eyeballs are close to the brain and everything, but it's still, it's amazing. You're like, all of a sudden, you're your own radiation detector. And you can actually <laughs> see radiation. So I tried to focus on that aspect a little more. I, you know, the, the radiation environment in low Earth orbit is not extremely concerning. We, you get a few um, particles, but, but overall, that's pretty well managed. It'll be more interesting when we go further. Rudolph. So, uh, is it being measurements of mutation rates in bacteria or yeast? Yeah, there, there have been some. There haven't been the big genomic studies that you and I would like to do. <laughs> so I think um, there ha a lot of the shuttle studies have relied on, um, in low Earth orbit, there's not enough radiation to make some big measurable detection. So a lot of times they'll like, pre-irradiate cells and then look at the radiation responses. Um, it, it's, uh, it, you either need a longer exposure or you need more radiation. So there is an interesting, um, the Russian Bion program is going to send a, a satellite 1,000 kilometers um, uh, and, and return it with a bunch of different uh, model systems. I think one of the keys is uh, either, either looking at some of the mouse studies where we're getting them you know, 30, 60, 90 days or longer or some really long-term cell culture studies. I'd love to have a chemostat on board. I think that would be a fascinating experiment. I, I'm not sure we've got the logistics set up for that. Um, but with the low levels of radiation in low Earth, you would need a longer exposure time, or you need to go beyond low Earth orbit. Yeah. Um, I have a question about like the specific challenges of microscopy in space. Um, is it safe to use lasers? What kinds of things are like? Yeah, so question about uh, microscopy in space and, and laser safety. And NASA's scared of a few things. Magnets are one of them. Lasers are another. Uh, so you have to do a lot of astronaut protection uh, work. But there, there's, there are a lot of instruments on board that do use lasers. Um, we, the Japanese actually have, um, they have some fluorescence microscopy. We're working on developing uh, better fluorescence microscopy capabilities. But it's certainly, uh, it's possible. You just have to go through the safety process, and it just means that much paperwork that you fill out, um, but it's absolutely doable. Yes. I'm also wondering if someone asked questions about the retina. Yes. Did you do uh, ocular pressure? Uh, yeah, so question about the question about the retina, and we do we do, do ocular pressure. Uh, sorry, you have a second question? So it's just that second question. Is anyone reporting us on the neuropathy in the space because of pressure of the yeah, it's interesting. So in the early days of the space program, we were very worried the astronaut eyeballs were going to explode, right? And then we went back to, OK, your eyeballs are fine. And now we're actually very worried about eyeballs again. So there's a, um, there's a syndrome that, that they've noted in astronauts, um, you know, originally called uh, vision intracranial pressure, uh, thinking about, yeah. So there's, um, this has definitely been reported. I didn't have any vision problems. The, 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 Population that tends to have this is men in their 50s, so I told them I have a solution for you. Um, <laughs> but we, I, I didn't have any. We did do a lot of studies. So we do uh, tonometry. We actually do OCT. So we do scans. Um, we, we look about you know every two weeks to every month um, at uh, choroidal folds, cotton wool spots, globe flattening, um, optic disc edema. And, and it, there's something about, there's some inner individual variation that we haven't completely figured out. But it hits some people. It doesn't hit others. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, are there, are there markers that we could use to screen for that? Um, and does that worsen with the length of exposure? Is this one of those things that you just hit some plateau and then it's OK? Or as we talk about two, three longer missions, are we going to be really worried about permanent vision changes? Did you, were you a pilot before you became an astronaut? And did you have any flight training, real flight training in preparing to be an astronaut? Yeah, I was not. And, um, and I, so, you know, if, if you're a good astronaut interviewee, you would go get some pilot training, and then you can tell NASA, oh, yeah, I've got 10 hours in a Cessna. And I, I didn't think about that um, until after all the interviews were done. And then I said, well, NASA seems to be a bit serious about this. I better make sure that I like flying. And so I went out to Hanscom and, and took some private pilot's lessons, and I loved it. Um, it's, it's incredible. I actually liked it so much I got a chance to go to the Navy to go to, you know, you do your initial training for backseat T-38 
uh, and they were looking for somebody to go to the Navy and, and go through flight school. Um, so I got a chance to do that and do T6 training, and, and I fly T-38s a couple hundred hours a year. Um, so I would say I'm a pilot now, but I, uh, I wasn't, it, which is really uh, speaks to the fact that you can train anybody to do anything. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> Mark flies an aircraft that I think when it's going downhill is about 200 miles an hour. Uh, I think you're closer to 20,000. So it makes me wonder, do, do you... In, in aviation, there's this term, task saturation. So you're coming into an airport, coming a little fast, the controllers tell you to do something you didn't expect, you've got to reconfigure the aircraft, you're getting behind the aircraft, you get tasks. Do, do you get task saturated on the space station? You absolutely do, and that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons that they use it as their prime training modality, is because you, it's uh, sensory stimulus that you're not used to, um, that kind of, you know, you start to slowly pull in and integrate all of these pieces of information. The more you train, you can read back your, your approach clearance at some point without even thinking about it. Whereas the very first time you're in an airplane, um, you know, we're circling a field at, at 400 knots and, and my instructor's like, you know, there's a throttle and we might want to slow down before we <laughs> land. So there's, there's pieces of information that you start to build into your scan pattern and, and you bring in and you get more and more comfortable with all this. And this is very true for anything dynamic like launch or landing, uh, where you think about controlling a spacecraft and six axes and all of the systems that are going on, as well as things like uh, spacewalk, where you're thinking about um, the geography of the space station, your next task, your 22 pages of memorized procedures, what's going on with your partner, what you're going to do in an emergency, and how to bring in all of that information and then prioritize it. Yes, back there. Uh, you mentioned, so your expeditions were about 120 days. Um, what, how, how do you think NASA should start preparing for astronauts to spend longer stays in space to account for some of the health issues? Yeah, so good question. Our, our expeditions were 120 days, or about four to six months on average, and how should we start preparing uh, for longer and longer space missions? Um, and there's a big community of researchers at NASA that think we need to start doing one-year missions and then maybe longer missions. I actually am not in complete agreement with that. I think most of the changes that happen, and you, you notice this on board, is it's massively dynamic physiologically in the first two to three weeks, and that's when all of your systems are adapting. Once you hit that, you get to steady state. And so the real long-term problems are, are probably things like bone, which we can mitigate really well with resistive exercise, potentially eye problems, um, you know, and maybe some radiation changes. And so I think what we need to be focusing on is incredibly reliable systems. So I spent a lot of time fixing the space toilet because it's, it's an experiment at this point, how to do, operate a closed loop system with humans in it. And so I think um, developing reliable systems uh, and continuing to look at, at exploration and research, we're going to be fine in a spacecraft for two or three years. I, I'm not too, too worried about uh, the, the psychological aspect or the physiological aspect. I think we actually have a pretty good handle on that, um, that it's much more about the robustness of the systems and that what experiments are we doing as we're traveling there and, and when we get to our destination. Over there. Related to that question, you said the rodents on the Gemini side had a 1P centrifuge control right, for experiments. Moving forward, is that something that the astronauts might actually get? Yeah, a long time ago, it was, in, it was in the space station design to have a 1G control to have a, a centrifuge module, and it just it turned out to be too expensive to build. Um, there are, you know, there's always folks that are thinking about you know, ways to induce uh, artificial gravity. How many hours of that would you need a day? Um, I think our, our exercise systems are pretty good. So we exercise two and a half hours a day. Um, we've got a treadmill that we can we basically uh, put put on that weighs us down so that we can run on the treadmill. We've got an exercise bike and we've got resistive exercise where we work against vacuum. And the combination of all of those actually seems to support uh, you know enough. Uh, it basically stops huge amounts of mus muscle atrophy. You got to relearn the sensory pathways, but you don't lose huge amounts of bone and muscle like we used to be. So I think we've actually got that that problem pretty well solved. There's, there's some other things where th people are thinking about lower body negative pressure. What, what are ways that we could um, offset and, and provide some countermeasures? Um, you know, the other school thought is let's just adapt to space and then it sucks to be back in gravity, but you know, suck it up, you got to go to space and, uh, and now you can get used to the planet again. David, I think uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking uh, Kate for this remarkable visit. Thank you.
Wow. Um, Kate and Maria and Rick, thank you very, very much. I, I think I can speak on behalf of the entire Whitehead Institute and MIT communities when I say, Kate, we're extraordinarily proud of your achievements. And we wish you all the best of success as you head to Mars. Uh, <laughs> 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 And I actually have, we have a small gift for you, Kate, and for you as well, Maria. So if you could both come up. Right. <laughs> well, let's see. Oh, yeah. Looks like it's got something to do with today's events. <laughs> and Maria. All right. Let's get the, uh, let's get the framed. Uh, yeah, here. Photo we'll off there. Thank you. <laughs> brought something as well for you guys. This is our Expedition 48. Uh, this is a flown mission patch, and I didn't get a frame. I'm very sorry, but it has a picture of spacewalking in our whole crew. Oh, wow. It's to Whitehead Institute. Hey, so. how cool. <laughs> wow. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'd like to um, thank all of you for joining us today and say that um, with considerable advice and input from, um, we couldn't think of two better qualified people, uh, Kate and uh, Maria, we have actually temporarily converted the cafeteria into a microgravity environment, <laughs> to which I now invite you for a reception. Thank you all. Right. <laughs> right.